Move over, Duke of Hastings. Take a hike, Anthony Bridgerton. There's a new man in town. Were I to tell you even the tiniest adventure, well, I would be forced to marry you. <laughs> Bridgerton season 3 is here with all the steamy romance that makes the show uncomfortable to watch with my mom. In this video we'll be going over the biggest events of the season and what they could mean for part 2. So put on your fanciest wig and grab a lemonade because there's a lot to discuss. Whereas season 1 focused on the relationship between the Duke of Hastings and Daphne Bridgerton and season 2 focused on Anthony Bridgerton and Kate Sharma, season 3 has 3, yes count them, 3 different love stories, all of them involving members of the Bridgerton family. There's Benedict Bridgerton and the widow Lady Tilly Arnold, Francesca Bridgerton and John Sterling, Lord of Kilmartin, and Penelope Featherington and Colin Bridgerton, who looks like he hasn't spent the last four months abroad, rather at Planet Fitness. The relationship between Penn and Colin is the focal point of these first four episodes. The two grew up as best friends, but Penn has always wanted more, whereas Colin is the talk of the town town and object of many a woman's affections, Penn is going into her third season as an eligible lady, with little to no prospects. In fact, her mother has basically given up on her. Not that you earnestly believed you might find a husband in your third year out. Oh, I really hate her. At the end of season two, Colin broke Penelope's heart after she overheard him say she'd never court her in a million years. You're courting the girl, Bridget. Uh, are you mad? I would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington, not in your wildest fantasies. And to make matters worse, Penn's best friend Eloise found out that she is indeed Lady Whistledown, the gossip rag that shattered Eloise's reputation by publishing an article outlining her tryst with a political radical by the name of Theo Sharp. Upper society isn't supposed to consort with the lower class, let alone romantically with a political radical. But we must remember, Penelope did this to save her friend. In season 2, Queen Charlotte, mad that Whistledown wielded so much power, went on the hunt to discover her identity, mistakenly believing it to be Eloise. In order to throw the Queen off Eloise's scent, Penn had to write a disastrous story about her. So when we begin season 3, Penelope is at her lowest point yet, with no friends and no prospects of marriage. The opposite is true of Colin. He seems to be the eye of every eligible lady's affection in the town. However, much to their dismay he hasn't come to take a wife. If you're asking if I came back to take a wife this season, I'm afraid the answer may disappoint. Which is funny since four episodes later he'll be saying this. For God's sake, Penelope Featherington, are you going to marry me or not? Colin is the character that goes through the biggest change over these first four episodes, starting as a cavalier playboy who sleeps with prostitutes with not a care for marriage or love. It is through his connection with Penelope that he starts to understand how much she cares for him, to the point where he questions can love really bloom from friendship. When word gets out that Colin has been teaching Penelope how to woo a suitor, she becomes the laughing stock of the ton, and Penn, believing she'll now die having never been kissed, asks Colin Colin to do her the kindness of being her first. It is here I argue Colin's revelation that Penn is the one begins to unfold. He dreams of her and even starts to get jealous as other suitors make their move. The introduction of Lord Debling provides a ticking clock for Colin to make a move or lose Penelope forever. You see Lord Debling intends to propose to Penelope as he wants a suitable bride to take care of his estate before going on a three year expedition abroad. While Penelope and Lord Debling enjoy each other's company, this is not really a marriage of love. Lord Debling's true passion lies in exploration, and if Penelope were to marry him, she'd resign herself to a life alone. Penn's mother loves this match as it would infuse the family with some much needed cash. In season two, they were on the brink of bankruptcy and only a forged letter from the disgraced Jack Featherington, who swindled members of the town into a fake diamond scam, holds their title in place. In episode one, we learn Walter Dundas, a man working for the Crown, is investigating this document, a document which states the next male heir will inherit the title. However, if no male heir is produced by the time he can prove the document is a fake, the Featheringtons will lose everything. It's kind of a running joke this season how Penn's two sisters, Prudence and Philippa, compete on who can have a child first. But my guess is that by the end of part two, Penelope will be with Colin's child and inherit the Featherington estate. Everything
everything culminates in episode 4 with Lord Debling about to propose to Penelope when he pieces together that she is in love with Colin. This will not do as he needs a wife whose mind will be on his estate and not on another man. He calls off the proposal leaving Pen in tears, that is before Colin chases after her. Here he professes his inability to stop thinking of her, how he dreams of her and cannot give her up. This is everything she's ever wanted in life, and he invites her to take his hand in marriage and brings her into his home. There's just one problem. Penelope has yet to reveal to him that she is Lady Whistledown. Colin despises Lady Whistledown, even stating what he'll do if he finds out who she is. But trust me, if I ever find out, I will make sure it is her life. That is ruined. It was Lady Whistledown who not only ruined his sister Eloise's reputation, but revealed he was working with Penelope to get her a match, thus hurting their reputations as well. Shit will definitely hit the fan once he inevitably finds out that Penelope is the person he hates the most, so we can definitely look forward to that in part two. Colin's younger sister Francesca, on the other hand, has found herself in a rather odd predicament. This season is her debut as an eligible lady, yet she marks the occasion by playing playing a funeral march on the piano. You do realize what tune she was playing just now, don't you? Mozart's funeral march. Oh God. Francesca doesn't seem too interested in finding love, and the suitors who attempt to woo her are shot down one by one. That is, until she is thrust in the middle of two men. One is Lord Samardani from Vienna, who is handpicked by the Queen to meet her. Obviously, this is a choice Francesca can't take lightly, as denying this match would be a slap in the Queen's face. Then there's the unlikely candidate of John Sterling, Lord of Kilmartin. The two meet outside the Hawkins Ball and share an unusual love for sitting in silence. She does not speak to him. I am in awe. Lord Sterling just seems to get Francesca, and when he finds how Francesca would change the music they hear outside, he goes and arranges a special version of it the way she would have liked it. He had the music we heard earlier this week rearranged exactly as I imagined it. It is honestly a truly romantic gesture, but this also puts Francesca in a bit of a bind. If she chooses Lord Sterling, she rejects the Queen, no doubt having some serious repercussions for the Bridgerton family. Remember that this entire final party in Episode 4 was to secure the Queen's match between Francesca and Lord Somerdani, which does not end up happening. Expect a pissed off Queen in Part 2. We also have to talk about Benedict Bridgerton, the second eldest Bridgerton child and his tryst with Lady Tilly Arnold. Lady Arnold is a widow, and it seems their relationship is both secret and primarily physical. Now, I could be crazy, but I thought it was rather odd that we get this scene where Tilly shoes off a lawyer when Benedict arrives. Is there something she's hiding that will come into play in part two? Is this a romance, or could Lady Arnold be using Benedict for her own ends? Part one also hints at love for Violet Bridgerton, who in the spin off Queen Charlotte tells Lady Danbury that her garden yearns to bloom, meaning she still wants that BBC, a beautiful boundless connection. Enter Lord Marcus Anderson, Lady Danbury's brother. He's back in town stating that a lack of society is what has brought him back, although Lady Danbury believes it's rather the lack of women. We're not 100% sure why Lady Danbury has such a negative attitude toward her brother, but it may have something to do with him having a reputation as a ladies man. And with Lady Danbury being one of Violet's best friends, you bet she'll come in between any romance between the two as she strives to protect her friend from Marcus's advances. By the end of part one, Penelope's sisters seem to think they're pregnant, which would definitely shake things up on who might be the next heir to the Featherington estate. With Lord Debling no longer proposing to Penelope, I wonder if this means Cressida will be offered his hand. Remember, her parents told her that if she does not find a match this season, they will find one for her. So we can see that part one ends with various plot points up in the air, including whether Penelope will say yes to Colin's proposal. But come on, we know what she's going to say. Yes, a thousand times yes. But will she say yes before telling him that she's Lady Whistledown? That will just have to wait for part two, which comes out June 13th. I hope you'll consider liking and subscribing as I'll be covering the final four episodes as well. But let me know what you thought of part one in the comments below. I want to hear your thoughts and theories. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember... Insert himself. Insert himself where?